Coming up on Tech News Weekly, it's me, Jason Howell, my co-host, Micah Sargent, and two amazing guests. We've got John Voorhees from uh, Mac Stories talking all about Apple's upcoming event and giving us a little bit of a preview there. Also, Addie Robertson from The Verge talks about Facebook's partnership with Ray-Bans for the Ray-Ban Stories glasses. Then we have some stories of the week. Micah sheds some light on Apple's somewhat flawed bug bounty program. And then I talk a little bit about how Germany is trying to push a seven-year requirement for software updates on smartphones. All that more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 200, recorded Thursday, September 9th, 2021. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Checkout.com. Modern businesses need flexible payment systems that can help them adapt, change, grow, and scale fast. Checkout.com is a leading cloud-based global payment solutions provider. Request a free, no-commitment demo at Checkout.com slash TNW. And by Compiler, an original podcast from Red Hat discussing tech topics, big, small, and strange. Listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And by ZipRecruiter. Businesses reopening means that millions of jobs will need to be filled. So where do these businesses turn to fill these roles fast? It's ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter's technology finds qualified candidates for your job and invites them to apply. Right now, you can try ZipRecruiter for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash T-N-W. Hello, and welcome to the 200th episode of Tech News Weekly. This is the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I'm the other host, Jason Howell. I had like streamers and balloons all set up to like drop when you said the number 200, but it didn't happen. I'm sorry. Oh, it malfunctioned. We'll just have to wait until 300. Yeah, malfunction. That's what we get. <laughs> Got the air horn button. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all for tuning in to this 200th episode if you're here with us. Uh, we have just around the corner an Apple event. Apple sent out its invites for California streaming. Um, we will be Petaluma streaming the event on Tuesday as well, so you'll be able to tune into that at the time. But um, with an upcoming Apple event comes questions of what Apple may announce. And so who better to talk to us today than Mac Story's own John Voorhees. Welcome, I believe, for the first time to the show, John. It is my first time. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Yes, we are pleased to get you on the show. Um, Mac Stories is, is, is prolific uh, in its content creation. <laughs> and I think uh, in particular, kind of the lead up to uh, what's going on at this event. So typically this uh, September event is the time when Apple announces new iPhones and also gives us some indication of when we're likely to see the next version of the operating systems that it rolled out or it announced rather during the summer uh, it tells us kind of when we're supposed to get those. But let's start with the iPhone. Um, what are kind of the the more solid rumors? What are the less solid rumors? And maybe even what are you hoping to see out of the iPhone, be it 13 or iPhone next? What, what What's going on here? It'll be interesting to see what they call this. I, I think it'll be a 13. And I think we'll see... I think we'll see kind of the trend continue of four different phones, uh, the 13 and then, you know, a larger and smaller version of the 13 and then a pro version, larger and smaller. Uh, I think you can bank every year on a new processor, something better, faster, you know, that uses less battery as well as camera improvements, which typically are a combination of both, you know, new sensors or lenses combined with software that allows you to do, uh, you know, new, new kinds of computational photography. So I think those things are kind of a lock uh, for this year, along with, you know, I, I don't think we're going to see this year a redesign. It's, it's not a year when I think we'll see significant changes in the way the phones look, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did, we did get, 
but um, you know, and always on display. That's something that Ooh. it's been rumored, it, and it's something that I'd really like to see because you know the Apple's had several years of working on the Apple Watch, and they recently added the always on display for the Apple Watch. And why not bring that which to the iPhone, which also has an OLED display, and allow people to you know display the time, the weather, maybe their calendar, their task lists, that kind of thing. So they always have that with them without having to unlock their phone. That would be interesting and always on display for the iPhone, yeah. finally. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we definitely, uh, do we know colors? Are we thinking, so they've done the the green, which was my favorite, right. I'm sad it's gone. And then they've done the blue. This is for the for the pro model, um, always, you know, uh, or m- m- more often there are more colors available for the non-pro model. Do we think there's going to be a pro color this year that's different from uh, the green or the blue? I feel like they're running out of pro colors. So I kind of yeah. wish they would they would they would get away from the muted tones with the pro models. I mean, I I think people who use pro phones want bright vibrant colors as much as anybody else. So I'd like to see the the color options just expand across the line. Why not let, let you know some of those pro colors trickle down to the non-pro model and then have more bright colors on the on the pro ones too. That would be really nice. Uh, I'm I'm in that camp for sure. Um, so stepping outside of iPhone for a minute, um, let's talk about what other hardware could be announced at this event. Um, there have been all sorts of different rumors for what could be there, but uh, let's stick with the solid ones. Uh, starting out, what do we what are we pretty much thinking where we can expect to see at this iPhone event? Yeah, I think the Apple Watch is kind of a lock for this event. I mean, what's interesting this year is that there appears to be a lot of hardware ready to go uh, inside of Cupertino. And it's just a question of how much is going to be released and when. And I don't think we're going to see everything this event. I think it's going to get spread out. I mean, last year there were three events in a matter of (laughs) weeks. It was absolutely bananas. It was, uh, we were very busy at Mac Stories. But uh, I I do think the Apple Watch is definitely a a high, you know, a, a likely, a likely piece of hardware coming out next week. So that, you know, we'll, we'll see what that is. I, I kind of feel like the Apple Watch is getting to a point of maturity where there, aren't as, there isn't as much low-hanging fruit that Apple can pick off in terms of both the software and the sensors. That's why I think the rumors of a redesign are pretty solid. I, I think we're going to see, I mean, the, the Apple Watch has looked essentially the same since the Series Zero came out. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we see a different look this year. Yeah, um, I'm right there with you on that. I'm uh, interested to see what we get and if uh, older bands are going to fit it or not. Um, right. if, if this would be the first shift for that, if that did take place. And I think uh, some people, particularly a friend of the show, Renee Ritchie, would be a little put out by uh, the the bands changing <laughs> given his uh, collection proclivities. Um, let's talk about audio because there are there have been some rumors of us seeing uh, some audio products at this event what what do we think in there we think uh, Apple's going to announce uh, airpods I think so I mean it, it seems like a natural fit with both the Apple watch and the iPhone because you know, those are obviously the devices you use airpods with a lot of the time and the the airpods 3 the the base model airpods have been rumored for quite a while now i'm not i'm not entirely sure what we're going to see on that front though i mean i think one option is a redesign of the head you know the earpods themselves so that they're maybe they fit a little better in your ears i've always thought that those those hard shell uh, AirPods are a little uncomfortable when worn for a long period of time. Mm-hmm. I, I also wouldn't be surprised if the maybe the stem shortened up a little bit and maybe got some better battery life. But there still needs to be some sort of differentiation between those AirPods and the Pros. So I, I'm not really I'm not really expecting to see things like noise cancellation on on an updated AirPods three. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting. I agree with you on the the firmness. <laughs> they, they can get a little yeah. uh, uncomfortable in the ear. Well, then outside of that, um, any other things that are maybe uh, have been considered to be at this event, but are maybe you're saying, eh, I don't know if we're going to see that there or uh, things that you think we could see uh, sometime within the next you know couple of months, as you said, Apple may roll this out into several events. 
Right. And I think that obviously the two big categories here are the iPad and the Macs. I think mm-hmm. probably the Macs are the least likely thing to be announced next week. Uh, we've still got MacBook Pros, a higher end iMac and a Mac Pro to be announced at some point with some sort of a- Apple Silicon chip. But and, and I do think we'll see uh, more Macs this year. I just don't think it's going to be next week. What I do think is a little more likely is, is a new iPad mini. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the iPad mini. I mean, I think it's one of the best devices that Apple makes or that anybody makes for that matter for reading. Uh, and so if you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of research, it's it's perfect for that sort of thing. Not, you know, not something that you want to type on and write on, but especially if you're consuming content and reading reading and that sort of thing or drawing, it's it's a great option. And so what, I, what I'd really like to see there is the design language, language that we saw from the iPad Air trickle into the mini lineup so that we get a touch ID on the power button. We get a more, you know, bezel, to, a smaller bezel device that goes more edge to edge as well as flat sides. I mean, something that just looks like it fits in the modern lineup is would be perfect as well as modern pencil support, which right now the existing mini still only works with the first generation uh-huh. Apple pencil. That's true. I, I forgot about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then outside of hardware, any predictions on when uh, other folks are going to be able to check out um, iOS 15 and kind of the whole host? I, and I'm, we got to be clear here. I know that there are desires that you folks have as writers about this. <laughs> yes. But yes. Uh, do you think Apple's going to drop a um, drop a doozy there and say, well, sorry, but it's coming out tomorrow? Um, or, or do you think there's going to be a little bit of lead time with this? Well, you know, they absolutely could. Last year they did it. uh, They dropped it 24 hours, not even 24 hours after the event. And that caught everybody by surprise because historically it had been more like a week to 10 days after that. I do think that last year was an anomaly because the iPhone event was later than usual. I believe it was in October mm-hmm. last year. And so I think we're we're on a schedule now that's a lot closer to the historical schedule. And I expect then that iOS 15 will probably, you know, the iPhones will probably go on sale for pre-order at the end of the end of next week on Friday, which is pretty typical. And then then we'll see the actual iOS 15 ship probably the next week towards the end of the week, I think. So we'll see. I mean, we're going to try to be ready. We obviously, as writers, want it to be one as much time as we can to polish things up, especially if there's some surprises dropped with the OS uh, next week. But, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be ready either way. Excellent. And then uh, the last thing that I wanted to ask you about is um, a question of supply constraints. Um, do we think that uh, when when it comes time on that Friday to place orders for the iPhone and on whatever day the Apple Watch comes out, is this going to be one of those? I mean, the iPhone events are always, iPhone pre-order days are always fraught with peril, but uh, we've heard talk of, of supply constraints for these different products. I um, think we're going to see these uh, Apple Watches sort of dipping in stock pretty quickly. And uh, what do you think for the iPhone? Is Apple kind of prepared for this and uh, it'll just be another typical Apple iPhone event? Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting. I mean, I think on the one hand, Apple has done a pretty good job of keeping its supply chain moving during the pandemic, despite you know, other companies having troubles, but they have had some issues themselves already. And as a result of that, plus the fact that the chip shortage seems to have gotten even worse in recent months, makes me believe that probably we will see some constraints there. I think there'll be, uh, you know, I, I, I'm less concerned about the iPhone. I think the iPhone iPhone is a device that has such high demand over so many years that a lot of that supply is hopefully locked in and that there will be a a greater supply there. But there have been rumors about the Apple Watch, and especially if it's a design change, which requires new components in the interior, uh, I could definitely see the Apple Watch being a little constrained for a while. Yeah. Well, um, I know we're all gearing up for the event uh, as I said, you'll be able to tune in on uh, Tuesday to, to watch it live here on Twit. And you should absolutely head over to MacStories.net uh, to check out all the great coverage there. And uh, I think you folks just launched a, a new um, sort of addition to the, the club features that you have. You want to talk a little bit about that before you go and also tell folks where they can follow you online? 
Sure, sure. We just launched new tiers of Club Max Stories, which is our subscription uh, service, which is more of what we do at Max Stories. And it's available at club.maxstories.net. We do all kinds of stuff over there, exclusive content. We have a Discord. Uh, we have a podcast, all sorts of things happening there. And of course, um, Federico Vitici and I also host App Stories at appstories.net. And part of what we did last week is we launched App Stories Plus, which is an extended version of that podcast that's ad-free that you can subscribe to. So we've got those two things going on. Uh, you can always find me over at maxstories.net writing and at Club Max Stories. I'm also on Twitter as at John Vor which is J-O-H-N-V-O-O-R-H-W-S. Excellent. John, thank you for your time today. We appreciate it. And uh, look thank forward you. to talking to you in the future. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All righty, folks. Up next, it's Facebook's take on Google Glass, or maybe it's Facebook's take on Snapchat spectacles, or maybe it's Facebook's take on You'll see. Uh, but first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Checkout.com. Look, tech shouldn't stifle innovation. Traditional payment systems are heavily layered, they're disconnected and perceived as a cost center to the business. Modern businesses need flexible payment systems that can help them adapt to change, grow, and scale fast. We recently came across a company with tech that approaches payments through a radical new lens, and it's called Checkout.com. Checkout.com partnered with Oxford Economics, and they conducted an end-to-end -end analysis of the payments value chain for merchants. Last year alone, false declines cost the UK, the US, French, and German markets $20.3 billion. That's with a B. $12.7 billion went to competitors, and $7.6 billion was entirely written off. The study found that merchants are not currently optimizing the consumer's significant willingness to pay for speed, for convenience, and for security online. The majority of merchants surveyed do not feel that their payments data is informing their business strategy or their innovation, and 56% of customers surveyed said they won't return to a site because they do not offer their preferred payment method. Most merchants spend more than 10% of their payments budget on fixing disputes, fraud, and outages. And CEOs are more likely to overestimate the quality of data returned to them by payment providers. CEOs also tend to underestimate the extent to which disconnected payments are hindering growth. And most merchants, they focus on the per-transaction costs of their payments ignoring back-end costs. Checkout.com is a leading cloud-based global payment solutions provider. Checkout's payment platform is purpose-built with performance, with scalability, and speed in mind. It's ideal for merchants looking to seamlessly integrate better payment solutions globally. It's why brands across the globe like Pizza Hut, Klarna, Revolut, and Samsung trust Checkout.com. Look, I know how I feel when I go to a site and there's a little Apple Pay button there on the site. Maybe for some of you, that's uh, Google's payments option. I am more, much more likely to go through with that purchase. And uh, Checkout.com can enable Apple Pay, and Google Pay, and some of those other options that are there. So I don't know about you, but uh, it definitely speeds me up through the process. I know I don't have to type in as much stuff. I feel more secure. Checkout.com can help you with that. Learn how to optimize your authorization rates with Checkout's free guide to better payments performance. This guide is full of expert advice and merchant insights to fast track your path to unrivaled payments performance performance. Request a free no commitment demo at checkout.com slash TNW. That's checkout.com slash TNW for a free demo. Checkout.com slash TNW. Our thanks to checkout.com for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All right. If I had a pair of Google Glass, which I actually do, I do own a pair of Google Glass. I just don't have them here with me. They're at the studio displayed in my like my uh my google like uh product display museum. area of the office <laughs> museum there we go that's the word uh if i had them maybe but it's a very you know hard maybe i'd be wearing them right now uh in light of the news today that facebook announced their well it's like facebook and ray-ban both announced together their smart glasses uh and so we actually have uh folks who have 
played around with the smart glasses, actually, you know, giving it a kind of a first look online. The Verge's Addy Robertson did not actually have the smart glasses on her face, but she's very versed, very familiar with this and all other things AR and VR. So the perfect person to talk to about this. Welcome back to the show, Addy. Hey. <laughs> it's great to get you back. Thank you so much for carving out some time for yeah. us today. Um, so where do we even begin with this? Because, you know, I guess anytime I hear about a company doing a smart glasses thing, I, I, I can't help but remember the Google Glass experience and how, <laughs> strangely, at some point, wearing those glasses, there were people, myself included, who were like, oh, actually, they look pretty cool. I mean, that that perception changed a little bit, right? So the design aspect of these things has really gone uh, gone from wherever that was to an area where it seems like we're at now where these glasses are starting to really fit in. And um, is as far as what we know about these glasses right now, what you know about these glasses, would you consider that like one of its main strengths? And tell us a little bit about these glasses and why they why they set themselves apart. So I think smart glasses is kind of a canny framing for Facebook because really if you hadn't mentioned AR, like if we didn't know that Facebook was working on AR, people would probably not call these AR glasses at all. The thing yeah. that they do is if you're familiar with snap spectacles, they're very, very similar to the sort of earlier generations of those where they're a pair of Ray-Bans, they have cameras in them, uh, you put them on and you can activate them to take short video or photo clips, and then you use a phone app to sync them and then you can post them online on any platform. like. They're camera glasses. Uh, they yeah. are part of a multi-year plan by Facebook to create augmented reality glasses. But at this point, it's kind of interesting that Facebook is sort of blurring the line, that it's introducing something that has very few, very minimal AR features, but in a way that is kind of calculated to get people used to the idea that it makes AR glasses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And I mean, we we have like a, a solid example of AR glasses in, in light of what we're seeing now from Facebook, we have Snapchat's uh, Spectacles. And of course, I think it was, was it last year or earlier this year that they announced the new version of Spectacles, at least seeded those to developers, those being, you know, actual glasses that show that have an AR layer. But that took Snapchat, what, three years to kind of get to that point? Like based on what we know about Facebook and their desire to really dominate in the world of AR and VR, like, do you think it? Do you think we're looking at kind of a similar time frame? If this is the beginning stage, and we're talking about Facebook that has massive amounts of money compared to Snapchat, do you think it's feasible to to see this leading into their AR view in uh, in the next year or two? I don't know about the next year, just because, especially with the pandemic, Facebook's product release yeah. timelines have been kind of up in the air. But That's we've true. known for years that Facebook is working on full-fledged AR glasses, and they've been pretty open about the yeah. fact that they're pursuing this multi-pronged strategy that they've called uh, Project Aria, where these Ray-Ban spectacles, I'm calling them spectacles, they're not that, they're uh, stories, um, they are kind of one piece of this. They're a stepping stone. And we know that Facebook is simultaneously pursuing stuff like AR interaction, which is not really an issue with these glasses because you can you hit a button. There's there are very simple like volume controls so you can listen to podcasts and you can say uh, you can say Facebook do this, uh, take a fit picture. But we know that they bought the company Control Labs a few years ago and they've been working on uh, these neural control wristbands. So we've already got one piece of a puzzle down the road. We know that they're working on glasses that have actual displays in them. So it's really hard to say when Facebook would actually release these things because there are a bunch of pieces that fall into place that often are more social than technical. But it is absolutely within the realm of possibility that Facebook is going to start showing off prototypes of them. The way that Snaps glasses are pretty close to prototypes at this point, they yeah. are not planning to sell them on the mass market. Right. Yeah, indeed. And they're also, you know, a lot funkier looking like th this is the first time. Well, I feel like there was another wearable glass uh, glasses that came out a couple of years ago that that looked 
almost normal, but this is about as normal as uh, like a uh, technology infused glasses, uh, you know, release has looked in my opinion. These look like really close to true Ray-Ban. Uh, I think they're the Wayfarers uh, style, um, not as thick and chunky as we're used to seeing, which I think ends up being kind of a big strategy um, or, or a big um, a big benefit to this, but also a benefit because these are going to be a lot easier for people to buy if they really want to spend three hundred dollars on a on a camera uh, set of sunglasses. Talk a little bit about kind of their their release strategy because I mean it sounds like these are going to be in stores that people are already going to. Right, so they're in stores. They're um, available in three different styles, uh, including the Wayfarer. I think that it's really important that they not just look like they don't just look like glasses because, like you said, there have been some companies like uh, North, which later got bought by Google. Uh, and go, Intel yeah. that created things that looked kind of like normal glasses, but they look specifically like a very well-known brand of glasses that people are familiar with. Totally. And so, yeah, they're going to be sold online. They're going to be sold in stores. Um, they're $300, although that start you start adding on more money for prescription lenses or polarized lenses. Um, it, it has been really interesting to watch the divergent strategies because Snap has always made these – I kind of personally like them more, like these weird sci-fi glasses. Yeah, yeah. Like their latest version are these very, like these round, hyper-minimalist, like coppery framed things. Uh, and Facebook's like, yeah, we're just, we're making Wayfarers. Here's a Wayfarer. It costs slightly more. Yeah, here's, here's a glass that you're already, or uh, a, a pair of frames that you're perhaps already comfortable with bypassing the fact that, oh, by the way, behind the scenes, this is Facebook. And I think I think for a large number of people who have issues you know, or take issue with Facebook and its privacy kind of inclinations or lack thereof, that's going to be a hard sell. What, what do we know about these glasses as far as kind of like that aspect of things? Facebook had to know, like, like I can look at Google Glass and I can specifically remember the thing I loved most about Google Glass, the thing I really only used it for primarily was the camera aspect. But ultimately that was one of the big things that really ended up destroying Google Glass. People felt like it was an invasion of privacy. Why is it different with these glasses? Yeah. So I think that, first of all, we don't really know how people are going to respond to them. I think sure. that Google didn't necessarily see a lot of the backlash against it, but they have a clearer recording light than Google Glass did, although at this point there are people who wish it were clearer. Like Snap Spectacles have at least, they really built into the design the idea that these things were going to light up. Um, Facebook has kind of a, a light on the front of them, so in theory you can see that they're recording, but it could be more prominent. Sure. Um they are saying that they're not using facial recognition, although that Google Glass did not approve facial, Google didn't approve facial recognition apps for Glass officially. Um, Facebook has been very clear that, look, what we use on Portal isn't facial recognition, even though it detects faces. Um, they have the sort of privacy safeguards that you would expect. And from one perspective, this is just, it's a camera that you put on your face. Like yeah. it's not really, unlike an AR glass pair that say, analyzed your surroundings that like could see what brands you were looking at that could do a lot of the weirder, more sci-fi stuff about that AR can do in theory. Um, these really, they take pictures, they upload them to your camera and you can post them online. They're not doing things that are particularly structurally different, but they're doing them in a way where it's much harder to tell if you're being recorded and arguably mm -hmm. than say if somebody's holding up a phone to you. I mean, there really is something incredibly dynamic about the kinds of pictures and the kinds of video you can record when you're actually wearing a camera. The story that I always tell, and I apologize if anyone on the network is sick of hearing this story, but I have video of my second daughter taking her first steps toward me while I was wearing Google Glass. And it was like, it's really magical when I go back and I watch that because I can remember because I wasn't holding a slab of technology in front of me. I was engaging with her and she was engaging with me. It's just so happened that like my video feed through my eyes was being recorded through Google Glass. So there's a lot of power here in how it records. Um, one, one question that I have, because because you mentioned like it really is just a camera that's on your face that ties into your camera roll, but I also know that you know Oculus is a Facebook company. 
Uh, for the longest time, Oculus did not require a Facebook account in order to run, and now it does. So anybody who thought that they were like getting hardware that uh, they could escape the grasps of Facebook, um, that's that's not the case. Is that different here? This is straight up just sending this these files to your camera roll, and it doesn't require a Facebook app or login to uh, do any of that syncing? Just the, it requires a, an app called Facebook View. It does not automatically sync things with Facebook, the social network. But yeah, if you were expecting something that is purely Facebook free, this is absolutely yeah. not that. Um, <laughs> it's just that structurally it does. The thing it does is take pictures and send them to your phone. It doesn't analyze the pictures. It doesn't do sort of really complex things with them. It doesn't have like built in AR overlays, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm curious about this. Um, I'm curious uh, in in your like on your side, are because because I know that you know this kind of stuff. From my view, looking in, you do a lot of coverage of a lot of uh, you know different wearables and and virtual reality and AR. And I realize this isn't VR or AR, but it's still kind of like this wearable kind of conversions between wearable and technology and stuff. Is this something that interests you? Do you envision yourself going and picking up a pair of these Ray Bans? I mean, conceptually, I think it's really interesting because it's one of the first big tests of how do people feel around someone who is wearing glasses that have technology in them and that are re potentially recording them. Like, I'm really, really curious to see how people respond to them. Uh, personally, I... I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm kind of scared of having something that extensive on my face. Um, Fair enough. And I don't really take that many pictures. And uh, at this point I don't really go outside that much. Um, yeah, but yeah. I, I do, I do go outside. I go outside sometimes, but no, I'm not personally that interested, but I know that a lot of people, especially with kids or with like pets that they really like to record and they don't want the pet looking at their phone um, that really yeah. love the idea. Yeah. It is funny well, to me that you apparently can't get them wet despite the fact that Mark Zuckerberg uh, posted a video of himself doing like kayaking in them. Oh, that's interesting. That's a detail that I actually had missed. So they're not waterproofed, which, um, okay. Well, I mean, that's, that's a big deal for a pair of sunglasses, which, you know, are glasses that are kind of meant to be worn outdoors, right? Like they're, they're meant to be out in the sun. You're probably going to be exposed oh, to other, the, uh, Yeah, I'm not sure that it's not, they are not necessarily going to completely break if you get them wet. Um, I yeah. don't have a statement on Facebook on exactly what they are, uh, but they did caution like you're not supposed to go out and wear them in water. Yeah, or uh, yeah, or, or water Alice's ski with wearing reporting. them. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good point. Right on. Well, Adi, it's always a pleasure getting you on to talk about this stuff. Really appreciate you taking the time to uh, to chat with us today. So thank you. Uh, if people want to follow you online, obviously your work is at The Verge, uh, so theverge.com. But if they want to find you online, where can they find you? Uh, I'm the Dextriarchy at Twitter, mostly. Right on. Cool. Thank you so much again. Have a great day. We'll see yeah. you soon. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Take care. All right. Up next, we're going to take a critical look at Apple's bug bounty program. Uh, that's going to be Micah's story of the week. That's coming up. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Compiler. This is an original podcast from Red Hat. We've talked about Red Hat podcasts uh, on the network before. This is one that discusses tech topics, big, small, strange even. Compiler comes to you uh, from the makers of Command Line Heroes. So you're very familiar uh, with, uh, with Command Line Heroes here, another of our sponsors, of course. It's hosted by Angela Andrews and Brent Simino. And, you know, technology, it's, as, as we literally just talked about, it can be big, it can be bold, it can be bizarre, sometimes complicated. Well, Compiler unravels industry topics, uh, the trends, the things you've always wanted to know about technology, uh, through interviews with the people who know it best on their show, you're going to hear a chorus of perspectives from diverse communities behind the code. Fascinating stuff. Compiler brings together a curious team of red hatters to tackle big questions in tech, uh, you know, things like what is technical debt? What are tech hiring managers 
actually looking for? That could be a huge benefit. And do you have to know how to code to get started in open source? The first episode actually covers the topic of, of a lot of debate in the tech world. Should managers code? Should they be coding? You know, jumping in to fix the problem, it's super seductive. But in that episode of Compiler, you're going to hear from a manager who's learned uh, that supporting his team to fix the problem, rather than actually doing it himself, uh, might actually be slower, but it can lead to better results, longer term results, right? Sometimes it's better to, to be sure that you're teaching someone instead of like jumping in. What do they learn in the process? A managerial position is seen as a milestone of working life. And suddenly, a person who worked on code begins to step back from these day-to-day -day tasks. What does that actually mean at that point? What started as an internal email at Red Hat then blossomed into a much deeper discussion about career growth and what can get caught in its wake. So maybe you've walked into an interview and you've been asked to work through a coding problem on a whiteboard. If you were hired, how much of your time do you actually spend in front of a whiteboard on the job, right? Uh, vast differences there, potentially. And how do you interview for a technical position? Red Hatters actually cast a skeptical eye toward the dreaded whiteboard interview, uh, but they actually discover that it can have some real benefits. Um, yeah, should managers code? Excellent stuff. I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to kind of see the world of technology through the manager's eyes. I, of course, am not a manager in technology, but I love the differing perspectives on this. And this really, this episode in particular, really pulls you into that and gives you kind of a, a well-rounded uh, view into what that's like. Episodes are out now. You can go and download them at any time and be sure to check back for new shows. As always, listen to Compiler on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you happen to listen to podcasts. Uh, wherever you happen to find Twit, you're, you're probably going to find Compiler. We'll also include a link on this episode's show page. So go to twit.com tv slash tnw find this episode and you'll find the link my thanks to compiler for their support of tech news weekly all right micah you are up tell us a little bit about uh these <laughs> well these ethical hackers i guess is what you would call yeah them. so this uh this story from the washington post published this morning as of uh thursday september 9th when we're recording this um and it talks about apple's bug bounty program in comparison to other bug bounty programs and what uh different hackers um, and security researchers have to say about it. What's interesting is, um, so, so for anybody who doesn't know, a bug bounty program is a way to incentivize sort of what we call ethical hackers, folks who are looking for uh, problems within a system. And when they find those problems, report them to the people who create those systems in order to improve upon the security um, and robustness of the technology. So if you uh, found a bug in Windows, well, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, and if you, you know, were able to recreate it and it, it is very clearly something that affects a lot, could affect lots of people and let people uh, access parts of the system. And you report that to Microsoft through the bug bounty program, then Microsoft is likely to issue you a uh, payout as they work through with you uh, solving for this problem. Well, Apple, I believe it was in 2016 that they launched this program themselves. And um, interestingly, as the Washington Post points out, it wasn't until 2019 that the program was open to the public. Uh, before that, it was kind of this sort of quiet, maybe you are part of it, maybe you're not kind of system that didn't really uh, have a lot of rules or regulations and understanding of what was going on. Um, so it's it's kind of late to the game in the first place. But uh, they, the, the Washington Post spoke with more than two dozen security researchers in talking about this and talked about kind of the difference between Apple's approach and others. Um, the the, the, the Post article says that Facebook, Microsoft, and Google all publicize their programs, and they even go as far as to highlight security researchers who receive bounties in blog posts and leaderboards. So not only do they um, 
do they make it easy for you to understand the rules of the bug bounty? But they also go as far as to say, hey, this person received a bounty uh, and this is sort of where they rank in the whole system. Uh, they also hold conferences and provide resources to encourage folks to participate. And when you compare that to Apple, from the outside, it certainly appears as if Apple doesn't really want <laughs> researchers to be poking at things and trying to find things. Uh, the Post article also looks to the payouts. Um, Microsoft paid $13.6 million in, uh, they say, the 12-month period beginning in, in July of 2020. Uh, so that's $13.6 million from Microsoft, $6.7 million from Google, and $3.7 million from Apple. So there are lots of things that are critiqued in this, and it, it boils down to some, kind of some, uh, some major points. The payouts are a lot less in general, but are also a lot less from what is originally advertised. Um, the communications with the team are a very... There's it's it's fraught with with uh, friction and misunderstanding or lack of communication, or lots of secrecy, and overall, it doesn't seem like the program is encouraged uh, in the same way that the other folks are, um, at, you know, at at work on doing this now. Uh, in the post article, it also goes on to say that Apple has a massive backlog of bugs that it hasn't fixed. Um, which with these bugs, these are, you know, the sort of internal bugs that have been reported. Um, and so they say, look, if you've got all of these bugs that aren't fixed, that are uh, sort of what the company itself has found, it becomes difficult to get to the bug bounty program as well. Um, so that was kind of what one of the, the security researchers was suggesting. It's like, what do you expect is going to happen if they report a bug that you already knew about but haven't fixed? Or if they report something that takes you 500 days to fix it? Um, so it's it's a really kind of troublesome uh, story here. And, and, I mean, not not in the sense of like the story itself is troublesome. I'm glad that the story has been reported. What, uh, I find it troublesome hearing what we kind of have known for a little while. I've heard rumblings and mumblings about uh, Apple's bug bounty program not being great and heard a few stories of folks who have uh, found issues, reported them, and then never received a payout at all. Uh, hmm. Some who have found issues, reported them, and then got a very small amount in comparison to what they originally thought they were going to get or should be getting, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there are several stories in here, um, so several anecdotes in here that kind of talk about that. So it's well worth taking a look at this piece um, just to kind of understand the, the sort of scope and nature of Apple's bug bounty program. But I also find, um, I find it interesting that a company who, well, let me say this, this company is very focused on secrecy. Uh, as part of its sort of business model. It is uh, very protective of its internal um, projects and products and plans. And trying to reconcile that secrecy and insular nature with also uh, working with sort of the public in this way, I think that the two are at odds in, in many ways. And that's kind of what this piece is, is proving. And... So it's kind of hard. It's like, what is the solution here? How do they balance needing that secrecy that, I mean, hey, it's one of the most valuable companies in the world. So clearly there's, so you know, it's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But at the same time, these things are broken and they do need to be fixed. So right. yeah. uh, you kind of go, what is the solution here? Um, Apple is saying, hey, you know, we're still working on it. We're still trying to scale this up. We're so but I mean, you started it in 2016. You took it public in 2019. Um, so there's been time. And yes, you know, it takes as much time as it takes. But at the same time, do you not want these bugs to be reported to you instead of them making their way to folks who will spend money on them who are bad actors, who can then take advantage of the systems that you have? I think I'd rather know myself uh, as, yeah. you know, as a, as a creator. So yeah, this is, uh, again, as I said, troublesome because I want 
Apple to be, a, as a, a person who uses Apple's technology, I want Apple to be among the companies that are honoring the uh, bug bounty programs that they put out and uh, sort of encouraging this type of reporting uh, to, to happen. So, yeah. Um, Google is really quite good about uh, its bug bounty. And also, um, it's not too uh, rare to see Google being listed as, you know, a, a specific team or teams at Google being listed as the team that has found bugs in Apple's technology that, you know, end up uh, getting bug bounties. So I think mm -hmm. there's something to that as well. Uh, not only does Google have some really good security researchers, but I do wonder if uh, you're backed by a big old company, it's probably a lot easier to get that bug bounty that you have been uh, promised than if you're just an individual who's trying to uh, get through with the bug bounty program. Yeah, I mean, I think w what you were talking about as far as Apple, you know, being so so secretive about things, it really does go counter to the fact that there's also this public image of Apple as being a very uh, private, uh, very privacy focused and very kind of like security minded, right? Like these things are buttoned up and people you can trust, you can trust Apple. Whereas, whereas Google kind of has this air about it that like, eh, you know, in, in some ways, some of Google's products, people uh, can kind of doubt that what they're getting is a highly secure, highly uh, closed down environment where Apple kind of has that air about it because it is so kind of locked down, you know, and, and, and that goes for its hardware too, right? Like its entire ecosystem is really drawn into itself and kind of protected from kind of like this sharing outside that Google ends up being so open. And I think as a result, that ends up being, uh, th that ends up being perceived as like Google's openness being like a, a weakness as far as like security and protection is concerned, whereas Apple is more protected. But yet, I mean, if you're as a company, not as open or not fostering an environment of of f finding this information from those outside of your walls that might actually help you discover things you didn't know about like that could yeah that could end up hurting you in the long run so it's i imagine for apple it's kind of a hard thing to like choose which side of the fence they're on cuz it's like it's like they would need to be you know on both sides of that fence at, at once and that might be a challenge um there was one piece in this report uh, where they mentioned that they've hired, Apple's apparently hired um, a uh, new leader for the bug bounty program this year. The goal there to be to reform uh, it to some degree. So it's possible that, you know, some of these changes might uh, take place and, you know, maybe, maybe it'll become a bit more equitable uh, in the process. Yeah. Um Again, I am glad that this is being publicized for sure. Uh, yeah. And this stuff, you know, again, if you're an individual who's come across these bugs um, and you have had trouble, honestly, we've seen time and time again that it does help to um, have these issues publicized because Absolutely. you suddenly don't get lost in the in the noise of the situation when you are uh, you know suddenly the Washington Post is is talking about your story and you know with uh, this article um, going as far by Reed uh, Reed Albergati, uh, going as far as to interview more than two dozen security researchers to talk about this and, and highlight the issues. That's not something you can just deny. Um, mm -hmm. You do have to answer the, the questions there and look, I think, very, uh, very, you, you got to look hard and see what, uh, what you are missing on and uh, do yeah. better. So Agreed. yeah, I hope this leads to Apple doing better. Yeah. All right, Jason, we've got your story of the week up next. But first, we're going to take a quick break so I can tell you about Zip Recruiter. Look, according to Forbes, gyms, nail salons, mom and pop stores, and more are set to go on an epic hiring spree in the coming months to meet the, quote, pent up demand for all of these services. Ah, going to a movie would be really nice. Going to get a massage, 
all of these different uh, businesses that you know we've uh, taken a step back from during this time. Maybe you want to get your nails did, have your uh, brows on fleek at the uh, at a local salon that does uh, threading, all that kind of stuff. We all want to return to that. And all of these businesses reopening means that millions of jobs will need to be filled. So where do these businesses turn to fill these roles fast? Well, it's ZipRecruiter. And right now, you can try it for free at ziprecruiter.com slash TNW. ZipRecruiter's matching technology scans resumes across its network of millions of job seekers to find qualified candidates for your open roles and proactively present them to you. You can easily review recommended candidates and invite your top choices to apply for your job, which, of course, encourages them to apply faster. According to ZipRecruiter internal data, jobs where employees invite candidates to apply get two and a half times more candidates. ZipRecruiter's technology is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Amazing. And right now, you out there can try Zip Recruiter for free at this exclusive web address. It's ziprecruiter.com slash TNW. That's ziprecruiter.com slash TNW. Zip Recruiter, the smartest way to hire. Thanks so much, Zip Recruiter, for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. Jason Howell, tell us about oh, yeah? your story of the week. Okay, I think I can do that. Yeah, check this out. Um, so my topic has to do with updates and security updates and OS updates, uh, because I always love these topics where, you know, you're really focused and uh, close to the Apple ecosystem. I'm really focused and close to the Google ecosystem. And this is totally one of those stories that that dances perfectly uh, on both uh, um, with both of those sides of the, the fence here. So we talk a lot about, um, you know, across the network, we talk a lot about phone support. Uh, Apple, I would say, in in my view, I'm sure you would agree, Micah, has a really great track record as far as this is concerned. Apple devices seem to be supported super well, right? Like, and I've talked to people who are like, yeah, I mean, those OS updates, if a new OS comes out, yes, it gets updated on a lot of those like older iPhones. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Some of the features might be missing. But from my view, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, but I, I mean, I get that. It, it's too bad that you don't get everything, but at least you get something. That's better than the mm -hmm. absolutely nothing that you sometimes get uh, with Google. So no doubt Apple has a better track record uh, than Google and other Android OEMs. iOS 15, in fact, you already know this, Micah, but Apple plans <laughs> to support devices as far back as iPhone 6S, the iPhone 6S Plus, which ultimately that ends up being like seven years of software updates for that device, which is amazing in my opinion. Like that's just, that's remarkable that you could have a, a one device for three quarters of a decade and it's still, you know, getting these updates and stuff, regardless of if there's a couple of features missing. That's pretty awesome. Um, Google and Android OEMs, on the other hand, really pale in comparison. They're better, but they're not quite there. Google has offered um, what Intel recently was kind of like the, the gold standard for Android OS support, um, three years OS, four years security. So that's three years of, of major OS updates. So if you got your phone with Android 12, you get 12, and then you would, my, my understanding is you would get 13, 14, 15, right? Three, three OS updates is, uh, I think, what that comes out to. And then four years of security updates. So that's that's good. It used to be less than that. You used to get like two OS updates and maybe three years of security. So it's stretched out a little bit. Now you have Samsung kind of on that same train. They made a commitment to the same, um, I think it was like middle or late last year. And some of the other OEMs are kind of falling into place there. There are actually rumors now that Google might bump its commitment up to five years of updates when the Pixel Ooh. 6 is released um, supposedly next month. All hearsay, obviously, at this point, it's still a, kind of in the rumor realm, uh, but still, that would be great, yet still a full two years shy of what Apple's able to do. And there's no question there's there's something to be said there as far as like Apple's control of its OS uh, on its own devices versus Google's, you know, OS running on all different types of devices. But, you know, again, when you're looking at the Pixel, that's coming from Google. So I do believe that Pixels should be the longest. Um but the reason I bring any of this up is because there are things that are happening, at least in the EU and specific to Germany especially, um, that might actually require 
seven years. The five-year mark is uh, is currently proposed by EU law, uh, by a EU law, um, that would require that five years of security updates on devices. I'm not sure if that's security and major OS, but still, it would require five years of updates, of software updates on these devices. The German federal government um, actually hopes to extend those requirements a full two more years. So that would be taking it to seven years as the requirement. And, uh, you know, so obviously Apple, <laughs> Apple would be in the clear, at least as far as the next version of iOS is concerned. Um, this would not only require software updates for that duration, but it would also require that there is continual access to spare parts that would not increase in value over time. So you'd have a device and you'd be guaranteed seven years of being, you know, getting those software updates getting a fresh display if you happen to crack your display or uh, replacing the battery because the battery deteriorates over time. Um, I, and I do think that that's important to point out because there are certain components that like you probably aren't going to replace your microphone in your phone, in your phone. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> right, certain right. components aren't going to fail as much as something like a battery or a display, but um but so those are those are kind of in the works. The EU has a repair duration in its plan already of, of uh, five days. So that's to say that um, when you through this plan, if you were to, you know, your phone was broken and you needed to get it repaired, they want that repair to be fast because if it's anything less than fast, then you as a user might be inclined to be like, ah, it's going to take forever. I'm just going to buy a new phone. And they want to avoid that. They want to encourage the longevity of these devices. And uh, the German plan actually uh, has yet to determine whether that time would be even shorter. Although off the top of my head, I kind of feel like five days is a pretty, um, I don't know, pretty comfortable time. I think anyone could understand why it might take that long to repair a device or something. Yeah. But that, that yeah, what do you think? <laughs> well, what do you think so I far? Mean, that, that in and of itself, uh, Honestly, I would be pleased if uh, they were like, yeah, five days. Um, yeah. And sometimes I've, I've seen repairs take a little bit less, but most of the time it seems to take even longer. And I've been okay with it. But um, when you have devices that are uh, sort of central to what you do, then that's where it becomes a bit of an issue. Um, totally, so any yeah. sort of trying to speed that up is is quite nice unless they work with like lender devices or something. But that always ends up uh, becoming even more troublesome in my experience, um, working with a lender device in the rare occasions when they do offer that. Um, mm. I think that the, uh, the idea of supporting older devices is really, really good. Um, mostly for the sake of kind of the false narrative that has existed that I think some people to this day still believe, uh, which is uh, sort of planned obsolescence for yeah. uh, these yeah, smartphone right. devices. And the fact, it, I mean, you and I know this, and so we can talk about it uh, for, you know, hours on end until we can't breathe anymore, but it doesn't, change that some people do feel like um, th as a new phone comes out, then their older phone starts misbehaving and doesn't load as fast and this and that and the other. <laughs> and yeah. I have certainly heard that from, because again, when you are the techie person in your family, I'm sure you've had this, you become the proxy for that whatever tech company. And so uh, I am the, the proxy Indeed. for Apple. So um, when somebody's phone starts misbehaving shortly before a new phone comes out or right after a new phone is announced, then they're letting me know that they're, you know, like you, of Lucky course, you, Micah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, this idea of of uh, repairability and uh, longevity of support, I think, helps to give an outsider's um, uh, belief that these devices are being supported as much as they can be for as long as they can be um, or close to as long as they can be, where it's not just the company itself saying, you know, because it's one thing we know, again, Apple and Google say we'll support this device for X amount of years, but to have a law that says that and then to see it in play, I think that that kind of can help shift people's uh, perspectives and go, oh, yeah, this actually is being supported for this long. And wow, a phone I bought seven years ago still works. That's kind of cool. Um, yeah. Or six or five or whatever it happens to be. So, yeah, 
All good. Um, my one concern is, as is anyone, uh, again, in our particular sort of corner of um, the internet, is security, uh, where at some point older devices do, uh, if, if they can't support the latest security technology for whatever reason, then that is something that you have to keep in mind. So um, yeah. that's, that's that's always true. something that worries me. And, you know, if, if you're running an iPhone 4 at this time and uh, Apple's no longer supporting them or a, a, a Pixel, the original Pixel or something, uh, and Google's not providing updates for that, uh, then maybe you are going to have one of uh, the exploits that has been fixed in later versions um, used against you. And that's scary. Yeah. I think one thing that I'm curious about, like uh, uh, I'm always really impressed, like when you know, I was talking earlier about a phone getting seven years of updates, because I'm like, how is, the, how is the then hardware still able to run the now software? And again, you know, Apple does this by kind of removing some features that might slow things down. I have also talked with people that are like, well, yeah, it runs it, but you definitely know that you're running, you know, an older device. Things mm -hmm. are a lot slower. It's not as snappy and everything. And so I take that and I apply that to the Android ecosystem. And sure, when you're talking about the high end, the premium, you know, devices that have, they're stocked with RAM now, you know, they got 12 gigs of RAM. They're running a Snapdragon 888. I mean, they're like as, as good as good can be in this particular moment. Maybe that's a device that could stand the test of time, that could actually last for seven years. But the Android ecosystem is much broader than that, right? Like that's and that's one of the strengths of the Android ecosystem is that it you know, you've got your really expensive devices with everything, and then you've got your dirt cheap devices, and those dirt cheap devices actually do fill a need for certain sectors around the world where people just don't have a lot of money to spend on hardware, right? So they're going to get those devices, and how are those devices going to do seven years from now? I'm not so certain that they'll do very well. If at all, like, like I'm not convinced that those bottom of the barrel, you know, processors that are required in these low, low cost devices could last seven years. Um, that, that seems, um, inconceivable to me to a certain mm. degree. So yeah, I don't yeah. know if there would be, um, concessions made for it because I mean, supporting for seven years is one thing, but you know, if you're, if you're going to have that phone and you're on your fifth update and like every single time you hit the screen, it takes 10 seconds to refresh it. Like, you know, then you enter the realm of like, okay, I guess technically it, it got its update and everything, but did it just make my phone actually worse from a usability standpoint? Maybe it's technically more secure, but I can't use it on a daily basis, you know? And so I don't know if that ends up being um, something that, that we encounter somewhere down the line. Um, curious about that. But the EU does plan to introduce its proposal officially, in 2023. So it's still a little ways away. They're still working on this. Obviously, Germany is trying to kind of increase things a little bit. I think the overall, my overall take on this is that I love requiring uh, device makers to uh, support for a longer period of time. I'm just really curious to, to see how this plays with the lower budget devices because I'm not, I'm, I mean, you know, intentions are great, but I'm not certain that hardware could actually last seven years. Like, I think it would actually be a really ex uh, horrible experience potentially. So mm -hmm. there yeah. you go. Yeah. All right. I think we've hit okay. the end of that topic. And that means we've hit the end of this show. Tech News Weekly. Thank you so much for watching and listening. We do the show every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. Go there, subscribe and receive our podcast every week on Thursday. Tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific, if you have questions you want to ask, well, me, uh, I am doing an Ask Me Anything uh, as part of Club Twit, which I'll tell you about in just a second. But uh, nice. it, this is an opportunity for folks to AMA, hosted by Ant Pruitt, who is the, uh, the content uh, producer, manager, content leader uh, for our Club Twit awesomeness. And so tomorrow we're doing the first Club Twit AMA. Uh, there have been some great questions added to the list. Um, so I'll be answering questions such as um, Whitney Houston or Beyonce. Um, okay. If I could steal a hat from Leo, which hat would I, would I steal? And... <laughs> 
Other breeds I love besides Chihuahuas, as well as many, many a tech question. Um, so that's going to be a lot <laughs> of fun. It. We'll do that tomorrow. If you want to, A, ask questions of your own, and B, check out that AMA, well, it's exclusive to Club Twit members, and uh, there will be more AMAs and things like that in the future. So yeah. all you got to do is head to twit.tv slash club twit. And for seven bucks a month, you'll get access to every Twitch show with no ads. You'll also get access to the Twit Plus bonus content feed that has outtakes and behind the scenes stuff that you won't find anywhere else. And last but not least, access to the members only Discord server, which is where this AMA is taking place. But it's also a great place to chat with fellow Club Twit members and those of us here at Twit. And in many cases, uh, appear on different shows, as uh, Windows Weekly is a common one that gets uh, questions from the audience. And uh, we try to do that with other shows as well. So a whole lot of fun. Twit.tv slash Club Twit, seven bucks a month. Uh, if you'd like to follow me online, you can follow me at Mike Sargent on many a social media network or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active online. And uh, you should check out Smart Tech Today, Later Today, which I host with Matthew Casanelli. It's a show all about smart tech, Internet of Things, etc. And iOS Today at our new time of, two, well, it's our new old time of Tuesday at 9 a.m. Pacific uh, with Rosemary Orchard. Although this coming week, it will be at 8.30 a.m. Pacific as Tuesday also happens to be the iPhone event. So we'd love, uh, I'd love to have you check out both of those shows as well if you uh, want to learn more about the smart home or Apple's various operating systems. What about you, Jason? Uh, let's see here. Well, Twitter, I suppose, at Jason Howell. Um, my other shows in the network include all about Android. Twit.tv slash AAA. Um, also did a hands-on tech this week that was just all about like, you know, we talked about him on this show uh, a couple of times, but all about all the Samsung stuff I have right now. I was like, eh, I'm just going to do a run through on everything. So uh, that's twit.tv slash H-O-T if you want to see that. Uh, big thanks to John Ashley at the studio. Thanks to Burke. Thanks to John Slanina, uh, everyone who helps us do the show each and every week. We couldn't do it without you and we couldn't do it without you watching and listening. So thanks for watching and listening to Tech News Weekly. We'll see you next Thursday. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. So you got yourself the brand new latest and greatest iPhone or Samsung smartphone because you heard about all of the beautiful photography those things can create. But for some reason, you're just not quite getting it done with when you try to make your photos. Or you got yourself a brand new camera because you were interested in getting started in photography. But eh, your little new inexpensive camera still isn't quite cutting it. Well, you need to check out my show, Hands-On Photography, here on Twit. I'm going to show you how to be a better photographer and a better post-processor. And quite frankly, just help you get the most out of that new camera that's, that's either on your phone or the brand new one that you just got for your, your birthday or gifts or what have you. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So head on over to twit.tv slash hop. That's twit.tv slash H-O-P and subscribe today. 